is up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a ton of comic books that have come out this week. comics. As well as, at the end of the show, we're going to hit a request that one of you dropped in the iTunes comments. If you yes. would like to request a comic, a older trade, an OGN, something that is current that maybe we haven't reviewed, just drop it in the iTunes comments. We would love to check it out. But let's kick it off talking about Saga number 55 from Image saga. Comics. Art it's not, by, it's what? a saga. It's saga. Saga? Saga? Yeah. I've forgotten because it's been so long. How no, you I think say it's it. Sega. <laughs> no, it just brought me back. Saga, Sega, however you say you know. it. Art by Fiona Staples, written by Brian K. Vaughn. Obviously, huge issue here. This huge. last came out on your birthday, I believe, Pete, in 2018, July wow, 25th. Wow, what a memory you have. Uh, just off the top of a noggin there. 2018, That's, what was that like? Oh, oh my gosh, great times. Uh, we had uh, a real president, first of all. What are you talking <laughs> okay. about? I believe we celebrated Start on that the birthday. Stack off hot. <laughs> we predicted, we were like, Pete, happy birthday. Um, and this, the pandemic, the coming was, pandemic will be hard for all of us, but we at least have this memory. <laughs> That wasn't the movie birthday, right? The one of the greatest birthdays ever had, where I got to go see a movie by myself. I don't remember oh, what mean, happened in no. 2018. We, what are we? we spe- that's, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. We, you didn't see a movie by yourself. <laughs> we went to the movies, and you chose to see a different movie. It Happy was the birthday. greatest birthday ever. It was one of my favorite things. You know? Wow. Regardless, why don't we talk about this book? Because speaking of not remembering things well, I certainly don't remember Saga very well. And this issue works as a 44-page reminder of where the characters are, where we left them. Three years have passed in the book, and we check in with everybody in their very different status quos. But it is just so good to have this book back at the same time. I agree. Why? Um no. <laughs> uh, I lying Pete. Um, I I agree. I mean, this book is is just so good. It's written in just such a smart, cool, casual tone that I think uh, you know is is very unique and rare in comics. This book has spent its three years be off, becoming quite horny, um, as we see <laughs> in these pages, um, which is which is great. And I love. We get a, a if you read the uh, to be continued letters page, we find out that it's a, um, uh, we've got another 55 issues almost um, of the book before it ends. Oh, wow. I think uh, he calls it a 104 page epic. That's exciting. That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Issue, issue, epic. Yeah, he he finished a while ago and just <laughs> yeah. this is all at, this is all cream. Pete, you love this book. What did you think about this issue? How do you feel about the title being back? Well, very excited to have it back in our lives. Um, yeah, I mean, the art alone is just worth it. It's just such fun, unbelievable art. Brings you into this world, this uh this world that we left behind for a while, and I was worried we weren't going to see again. I was a little. I was like, wait, is it, was it that dude's skull that we was like the dad? I was having a hard time trying to remember. Yeah, I had completely dad's... forgotten that Marco apparently had died previously in the series because the will does show up with his skull. We're talking yeah. about the influence on Hazel and Alana and all of the rest of the characters, the fact that he has gone here. So it. I mean, I assume this is purposeful, but structuring the book so that Marco dies and then we get the second half of the book makes a lot of sense here, because certainly this is a very new dynamic. This completely changes what's going on, even though we are checking in with all of these characters again. But in, I think seeing Marco's skull was sad uh, mm-hmm. at that po- at that moment, and having um, the will and uh, Marco's ex just be so sort of like happy, and then having sex there. I was like, mm-hmm. okay, this is pretty callous toward our old uh, dead character. But then I remembered that's where those the term are skull fucking thing. comes from, right? Oh my god, I was really hoping <laughs> you weren't because he said skull, and they start about talking about. Fu- I was like, we're just gonna let it go. We're gonna let it go. <laughs> I like yes. to, I, Pete. I like that you sometimes just don't take the shot. You yeah. you write it down in your notes like skull fucking make question mark and then you move <laughs> past it. That's uh, right. But but there sometimes are ghosts it's in the shots world. you don't take, bro. That's mm-hmm. right. Uh, there are ghosts in this world. Mm-hmm. Like we may get to see Marco yet again, and I would think that we will. Yeah, Ooh, absolutely. The thing nice I'm most call, excited dude. about. 
most excited about with this issue is as we are entering the second half of this title here is ultimately what is the overall story that they're telling? I don't think it's meandering by any means, but there has been this promise from the very beginning that we were telling this big Uber story that is not necessarily about the galaxy and what's going on with this big war in the galaxy, but a smaller story about this family. So now that the dynamic has changed, now that Marco is gone, at least in some form, even though potentially, like you say, he could come back, where are we heading towards? What is the eventual end point of this, even if that's at this point, maybe another 10 years of the future. I'm just worried I'm about this kid. I, I want to make sure she's okay. You know what I mean? Like, uh, She's savvy. I mean, she, uh, I feel like, is her father's daughter and is uh, maybe almost replacing him in the story in a way, just like his, his tone and style. And another thing about the tone of this book and this issue particularly, we get to see like horrifying, tragic things in these pages, as well as like really funny, light moments. And... No, no other book out there does it does those two things at the same time as well as Saga. And one other shout out that I'll give. I mean, not that Fiona Staples has been underrated in terms of this book, but it was just so nice seeing the art style, the integrated lettering of the book here. It's just something that I missed in terms of just getting into this, not just the world of the book, but literally the world of the book, the way that it's created, the way that she puts it together is so beautiful and. There was, I don't know, it felt comforting in a certain way to go back to that. Well, it, this I think this is one of the first times we've seen the Will and Lion Cat together. Uh, so that was also very comforting. Yeah, I agree. It was like a warm blanket of, of kind of like, oh, that's right. And yeah, and all these characters are great. And this comic is hilarious and weird and very surprising. A warm, horny, violent blanket. There you go. It's the best kind of blanket, I guess. <laughs> Time to tuck in. This next my horny up, blanket. Next up, Peacemaker, Disturbing the Peace, number one from DC Comics, written by Garth Ennis, art by Gary Brown. Now, of course, this is semi tying in with the Peacemaker's TV series that is on I mean. HBO Max. <laughs> It's a title that is similar to the title of the TV series, even though it's an entirely separate thing. This is a very Garth ennis going through the history of Peacemaker in the DCU, very black label, very war-focused. Um, uh, Pete, you're the Ennis specialist on this podcast. How did this one strike you? Uh, you're the Ennis menace? The Disturbing the Peace, number one, I, just... Wow, I was really impressed with it. It's disturbing but good. It's I, I find it like a, a really impressive, creepy tale of Peacemaker. The art was amazing. That it was very Garth Ennis esque. I loved it. I thought it was all that I was hoping I was going to get with this number one. It's Garth Ennis esque to the point that Garth Ennis wrote it. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes yeah. you have people writing things and, mm-hmm. you know, you're like, oh, man, I can't believe this was Ennis or I can't believe this was so-and-so. That's a very and, Pete-esque thing to say. Oh, fuck yourself, man. Great. Um, I mean, this book, um, I I liked it. I mean, it's so violent and intense, like yeah. not my particular favorite flavor of life mm-hmm. um, to really be uh, sucking on. But here we are. And uh, this I just it's very funny to me that like this is the book they put out when people are watching Peacemaker because yep. this this book is like the opposite of the Peacemaker show. It is like oh it's a very, different take for sure but yeah. it gets I mean if I watch Peacemaker and then I saw this book was there I it it fits the kind of twisted sense of humor I think. Yeah, um, but I guess it's just funny like I think this book is great. I would be releasing like a Tim Seeley Peacemaker book right now oh, or somebody saying. that's writing a little bit closer to the tone of the TV show. to the tone um, of the TV be- show. Because if I'm a fan of the show coming into this book, I'm like, Jesus. But that's right? the thing. Because this that's is, a- first of all, this is a Peacemaker who knows what he's doing. He yeah. never is in costume the entire time. And his idea is I can bring people peace. That is why I'm Peacemaker. Versus right. the show, he's a doofus He's in costume pretty much the entire time, and he's bringing he got peace. In. He was he's bringing peace it. by any cost. So it is a very different thing. I think you're right, Pete, that it has a dark sense of humor. That's the connection here, and ultimately, but, it's a good book, so it doesn't matter. But right, yeah, I but agree I just with Justin. Think, it's interesting. I, I think, like a lot of the stuff we see now, where it's like 
uh, we don't want to see an exact adaption to something. We want to see uh, uh, something a little different in a similar world, and I think it's uh, I think it does that. Yeah, and honestly, like this is the perfect Garth Ennis story. I think he, Garth Ennis could write a story just like this for The Punisher as well. Uh, yeah. Like it is definitely like fully in his wheelhouse. If you're a Garth Ennis fan, you're gonna love this book. And yeah. as someone who's not a big fan of this type of story, I was still super engaged with it, and it has a, just a great arc to it throughout. Uh, so it was, I really enjoyed it. Just surprised by the tie-in. Let's move on to X Deaths of Wolverine, number one from Marvel, written by Benjamin Percy, art by Federico Vincenti, Vincentini, excuse me. In X Lives of Wolverine, Wolverine has been tasked through seemingly to travel through time, save Professor Xavier from Omega Red, who is trying to kill him throughout the time stream. We're not 100% clear on whether that's actually what's going on, but that seems to be what happened with the first issue of that. So you would think this would complement it, and maybe it will eventually. But right now, the majority of this book is kicking off right after Inferno with Moira, Moira McTaggart on the run. She's now human. She's found mm-hmm. out that she has stage four cancer, and she's going to do absolutely anything to save her life. Meanwhile, in the background, somebody shadowy is chasing her and tracking her down. There's a lot of wild swings in this book, but... I thought this was nothing that I expected, but I still loved it. Well, it's interesting because it's bringing your favorite character, Alex, <laughs> and my favorite character together. Who is my way. favorite character in this case? The cipher. It's like a cipher Wolverine at the end. Oh, it's a warlock Wolverine. Warlock, yeah. Yeah. But or say, maybe but a I, Tron Wolverine is a fairer way of putting okay, it. Okay, well, oh, whatever. Wow. <laughs> my favorite Scott, movie. My favorite movie. You think? Yeah, I was going to say. Your, <laughs> your, your compromise, your your compromise is Tron Wolverine? I don't know. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I I think this is very interesting. This is a, uh, you know, I really haven't been enjoying X-Men lately, but this is an interesting take. And uh, I, this definitely got my intention, and I love the last page, and uh, I think it's very cool. I am stunned right very now. Very interesting. I know I'm how to react. Stunned, Pete, because I, I was so surprised that this book is picking up on the Moira McTaggart and all the yeah, other X continuity yeah. stuff. To have this be sort of the, I guess, the main X Men book right now is not like this is the main story. Um, to ha- sort of push it into this Wolverine book feels very strange to me, especially since it's a crossover where we've already established Wolverine traveling through time. But having said all that, like, this is cool. The Wolverine reveal at the end, I was like, this is a cool Wolverine. What's his deal? Yeah. Um, not a lot of death here. Uh, not a lot of life in the other one. So, like, this feels like... Hickman hasn't really left this universe. And Mm -hmm. I mean that as a compliment. Yeah, it's, I don't know what's going on in this story, but just the basic idea of Moira Taggart on the run, Mystique one step behind her, this weird Wolverine also tracking them both down. There's enough going on here to make this super fascinating. And I, I thought this was going to be one of those side events if you just kind of check it out and it's about Wolverine and he's doing some fun Wolverine stuff. But this seems so much more than that. It has so many bigger ideas. I'm very excited now. Let's yeah, move it's on. a, it's oh, a great ahead, first Pete. issue of like, hey, if you're not sure of what's been going on, here's a little bit of what's happening. And then just kind of like uh, treating the shadowy character really well. So, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was did a great job of getting us, the reader, excited for more. Let's talk about Dark Blood, number six, from Boom Studios, written by LaToya Morgan, art by Moises Hidalgo. This is the last issue of this book, finally revealing a lot of the secrets that they've been holding off on and uh, finishing it up while still potentially leaving open for more in this world. I thought this was a phenomenal story that I was really impressed by, balancing multiple timelines throughout that ultimately came to bear here. and. Also, this is something that I think is going to read really well in trade in particular. Uh, what about you guys? Yeah, I agree. I, I agree love- with you. Like, I feel like oh, the putting these the, the multiple timelines I thought was like just difficult. And this book really pulled it off and was able to like have the all the tension sort of come together in this last issue at the same time in a way that really worked. I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I really love the art. This is a very creative, interesting story. Uh, just really cool 
badass moments. Uh, yeah, powerful. I love it. And uh, we didn't say it's about a guy who gets mm-hmm. – um, we find out in this issue um, he's been – Sort of in, in, injected with a, some a bunch of chemicals, or a, a bunch of people throughout the area where he grew up has been have been treated with these chemicals, and he survived and confronts the scientists that um, uh, hurt or killed ev- so many people in their experiments. Yeah. It's a very cool story, and Latoya Morgan, the author, is going to be on our live show next week. Woo-hoo-hoo. So if you want to find out more about the book, definitely check that out then. Let's move on to talk about Batman Catwoman special number one from DC Comics, written by Tom King, Ram V, Walter Simonson, art by John Paul Leon, Bernard Chang, Sean Crystal, Mitch Gerads, and Dave Stewart. Beyond being a story of Batman and Catwoman, not every year, but most years on Christmas, told one page at a time. This is also a tribute to John Paul Leon, who passed away recently, I believe, uh, through various stories uh, throughout the back matter, as well as the art. Uh, This is, if not the issue of the week, definitely one of the top issues of the week. Uh, What did you guys think about it? I mean, it's 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 very moving. It's beautifully drawn. It's you know, we kind of get a nice perspective of cat and bat over the years. I I, I can't say enough about this book. It's you got to check it out. It's Tom King is just really killing this. I mean, the, the I think this is for me, this is the book of the week um, for a couple of reasons. One, like the the Batman, the bat cat stuff that Tom King's been doing both in the main bat book and then in the spinoff that he's in the last year um, has been really good. I've enjoyed it. It's super convoluted. This book does it all in one book. You could just read this book and it is it. It's their relationship distilled down. You get to see from uh, Catwoman's perspective, um, sort of who, how she became to be, to be who she was, what uh, a distilled version of her relationship with Batman in a great way. And just, showing Batman and Catwoman coming from opposite places, essentially sort of coming together and then almost crisscrossing in the way that where their lives end um, that I thought was just really well done. There's some parenting like parenthood in here that was really like beautifully done. Everything's beautifully drawn. And then the second part that was so great about this book is just the amount of love out poured out for John Paul Leon at the at, who passed. And I don't know if he was working on this book when he died or exactly what happened, but you get to see really read creators just going to bat and talking about someone that influenced them and awed them throughout his career in a way that you don't really get to see. And I wish they did more tributes like this as opposed to, as opposed to just the like double page spreads we get in a lot of books, which are great. But I feel like having people talk about an artist or a writer's influence on them is so much more powerful. It's this beautiful. is get this book if you're if you're not if you've been turned off by the complicated nature of this cross of the Bat Cat book, pick this book up. It will it's worth it. It, it gets it gets. It. I, I agree. This is everything that I've wanted from Batman and Catwoman and have not been getting in like you said one issue. It's absolutely phenomenal. Next up, Night of the Ghoul number four from Comicsology Originals, written by Scott Snyder, art by Francesco Francavia. This takes place in eh, two timelines, is it exact? But it's showing an old movie called Night of the Ghoul. While in the present of the book, somebody is investigating the filmmaker there who seems to indicate that the ghoul of the title is in fact real and in the hospital they're in right now. Mostly, this is a phenomenal showcase for Francesco Francavia's very creepy, very upsetting art, Uh, but it's great. I really enjoy the horror of this book. What about you guys? Yeah, I mean, it's it's beautiful. The the use of color in this is really just... uh, It pops, it's scary, it's moving, it's all the right things. It's uh, kind of like a... Uh, classic tale, but done in a cool way that's artistic. You got to, you know, tip your hat to the people doing it. They know their stuff. It has that slow pace of an actual, like, 1930s or 40s horror movie. Um, Like, everything is sort of creeping up on everyone, both the monster, the revelations that are coming for the characters, and we get a last page reveal that's, like, uh, gross and scary, building up to is next issue the last issue it certainly feels th- that way based it feels on that way where yeah. this issue ends 
Yeah. yeah, I guess we'll see. Uh, but this is a lot of fun, particularly if you like horror. Next up, Mary Jane and Black Cat, number one from Marvel, written by Jet McKay, art by C.F. Via. As indicated by the title, this is Peter Parker's current girlfriend and his ex-girlfriend teaming up for a caper. Uh, and while he lies in bed with some radiation sickness, Justin, you're a big we've fan all been of the, there. We've all been there. You're a big fan of the Black Cat run from Jen McKay. How to feel to get one more issue? It felt great. Like Jen McKay is sort of the the Black Cat scribe, and uh, he's, he's so good at writing the adventure side, the like superhero side, the thievery side, but also like getting into the emotional life of black cat and the characters that surround her. And in this issue, like it's a great Mary Jane book. Um, I know there's been like a lot of Mary Jane stories and she has sort of her own stuff going on a, a little bit in the last couple of years, but this book feels like such a great combination. Um, Mary Jane sort of goes uh, on a, a mission to save Peter's life with black cat. They sort of compete in a fun way and then have a great heart to heart. Yeah, the heart to um, heart on the roof on the at the end top was worth it's it. It's so good. And that you just, just really you I you identify with both characters and you really feel for both of them in the right way and it's all their relationship exists in this issue outside of Peter Parker. Peter Parker's not a part of this. It's not like yeah, it's just two exes talking about him. It's really about them and who they are and how they relate to each other and I thought it was great. Yeah, it just uh it's a yeah. It, it's a great way to see MJ. Um, you know why MJ and Peter are the fucking end game, and it uh, it's you know I I think it's a it's really well done. So uh, I you know love the relationship stuff just like Justin. They were end game, but they were snapped out of it. Mm-hmm. They were don't unend games. This. Don't ruin this. They I'm trying to agree game. with you. I'm trying to say that your relationship stuff is worth it. And then Why do you, you have to fu- try to agree with me? You just agree with me. Ugh, you're just my guy. I think it was weird that Carly Cooper wasn't in this book. Next up, <laughs> House of <laughs> said Slaughter. No one said no one ever. House of Slaughter, number four from Boob Studios, written by James Tynan IV and Tate Bromble, art by Chris Sheehan. In this book, our two main characters have come together and break apart once again. We get them in two timelines, one back in the day as we find out more about the House of Slaughter and how it works. And in the present, as uh, the one who is still with the House of Slaughter has been tasked to kill the other. This is, as we talked about with previous issues, a beautiful and harrowing romantic tragedy throughout. I love this book more with every issue that comes out. Hells you said to, it. Hells to the yes, man. Like the, like we're, at first we were like, Oh, house of slaughter not as good. Cause of the, it's a different kind of thing than the main character, but now it's really found its voice and it is killing it in a way that is so enjoyable, getting us different characters, their backstories doing it in such an amazing way. Love the art, love the action. This is just, uh, it's powerful, great stuff. I agree. And I actually, I have been liking this book a little bit better than the main book. And the something is right, killing let's the children. Let's not get goofy. Let's not get goofy. Oh, only because, and I'll tell you why, I don't mean to, I'm not disparaging the other book. I'm just it saying. Seems like you are. Can't you just hold things up without pushing something down? No, to be I'm clear, saying, like, something is killing the children is bad. House of Slaughter is good. Go ahead. Go, go yeah, after I'm yourself. Just don't, I'm just helping no, out. Come on, man. I'm There's helping. no need to do that. Alex is helping. There's enough uh, flowers to go around, man. Flowers? What does that mean? <laughs> what do you mean? People their flowers. flowers dude. Give the people their flowers. You know what I mean? You can be nice. Wait, to people? people? Wait, hold on. Sorry, sorry. People are flowers? Did you say? Oh my god. Or take give their people flowers. flowers? Pete, you All wanted right. us to take a bunch of. I'm right. sorry, I sent you that edible arrangement when you wanted a flower. I messed <laughs> up, and I agree with you. You should have gotten flowers. Technically, fruit comes from flowers, so it's the same thing. That's right. Plus, you can't eat flowers, which is the edible arrangements whole thing. Yeah. Hey, edible arrangements started in Rochester. <laughs> See, look, we, found a, we scraped out a win here. We scraped out a win here. The us. original garbage plate was flowers. Okay, go <laughs> ahead, Justin. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. I sent my wife a garbage plate on tiny sticks uh, oh, as an edible <laughs> arrangement. Oh, okay, yeah. 
<laughs> she wasn't happy. She divorced me when yeah, I sent I'll her tell a garbage what, plate. The on hardest Steve. thing is getting the hamburger to stay on the sticks. Uh, great. Everyone definitely knows what we're talking about. All I was saying <laughs> is, if you haven't, if you like something that's killing the children and haven't given this book a look, I think the pace of this book has been uh, up and interesting. And like Alex said, it really is a tragic love story. Um, which is hard to do well in comic books, and this is doing it. Superman and Robin, special number one from DC Comics, written by Peter J. Tomasi, art by Victor Bogdanovich. This is teaming up... <laughs> A little sing song there. As you can... Bogdanovich. As you can tell... Bogdanovich. The title, it's teaming up John Kent and Damian Wayne once again under the steady hand of Peter J. Tomasi. He knows what he's doing here with these characters, sure and he's just having a good time, and it's good, to, always good to have him come back and write these characters whatever he wants. Super Sons! The Super Sons are hanging out again, and I love to see it. They, the, the fact that they aged up John... Um, it, it feels like they have to keep referencing why he's so much older than him. And the fact that it's Superman and Robin now, as opposed to Superboy and Robin, I, I like that they've just owned that and they're still able to tell these same great stories. Their relationship is one of the best in comics, I think. They are friends. They mess with each other. It feels so real. And it's great. I read this comic and I was like, oh, that was fun. Uh, these two together are just a good time. Uh, D- DC really found a, a, a really something special and to hold up here. This is just good stuff. Once in Future, number 24 from Boom Studios, written by Karen Gillen, art by Dan Mora. In this issue, our main characters are running around trying to find some magical solution to the fact that all of England has been taken over by an increasing number of Arthurs and Merlins and various competing myths. We get yet another one teased at the end of this issue. There's a lot of stuff going on here to the point that even the characters are like, oh, God, this is, this is later on a lot of stuff. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm still really enjoying this, but I'm starting to side with you a little here, Justin, where I'm like, we got we to gotta get to something. And granted, we're getting to issue 25, so I'm sure we're coming to something. But when even the characters there, there, there's one point when they introduce yet another Arthur and Merlin, which, mind you, is a brilliant concept. The fact that there are so many competing yeah. myths, of course they keep showing up, and of course more of them show up. But there's some line where the Merlin is like, oh my God. <laughs> well, Why? and let me just say, here's what it feels like reading this comic. And again, I also enjoy this comic. Beautiful art. And Pete, you can you can glow up about it in a second. But reading this comic, it's, it's like sitting down and playing chess with someone. And they're like, okay, let me get the pieces out. And they put the chess pieces out. And I'm like, great. And they're like... Uh, they put more out, and they're like, I'm like, that's a checker. I don't think you can play. You don't need the checker. And then they're like, oh, watch this. And then they put a bunch of Cheetos on. I'm like, I don't need Cheetos on the – those aren't pieces on this board. We're just playing chess. And they're like, no, no, no. What about this? And I'm like, those are baby teeth. Are those your baby teeth? Why are you putting your baby teeth out there? And it's just confusing because there's too much stuff on the board. Like, why am I playing chess with baby teeth, Pete? All right, well, I'll tell you what. Because you didn't know how much the important the baby teeth are until you started playing chess with them. Listen. And what are the Cheetos? You guys are fucking crying over some bullshit. All right. This book is (laughs) unbelievable. Okay, coach. (laughs) It's unbelievable. It continues to be unbelievable. The art alone is worth it. Every single issue, amazing characters with the twist. I... I can't recommend this book enough. It's a powerhouse. It's beautiful. You have one of the (laughs) most badass grandmothers of all time. Come on. What about my grandmother? Yeah, what about my grandmother? Nobody's talking about your grandmothers. Neither one of them. Yeah, that's what I that's what I wish. Um, Pete, even if grandma in this book turned to the panel, turned to the reader and was like, There are too many Arthurs and Merlins in here, right, Pete LePage? (laughs) Even then, you wouldn't be bad about this book. That's right. It's too good to fucking say anything bad about it. It is be- too good. Before and we it's get called to the next breaking title, the fourth I'm- wall, you dick. You know better. And here <laughs> I, I am playing say, chess with baby teeth. Yeah. Uh, well, you got to because you're not learning right. My ultimate dream now is that whatever volume this is collected in, they use as a pull quote right above the title, like playing chess with baby teeth. <laughs> 
<laughs> that would make my, it makes make my life, sense. to be honest. <laughs> Devil's Raid number three from Marvel, written by Chip Zdarsky, art by Marco Cicchetto. In this issue, as expected, Luke Cage is running for mayor against Kingpin, who's going hog wild, shutting down the superheroes of <laughs> New York using the power of the Purple Man. Everybody talking about chess moves is making some big moves here. As we find out some secrets about what's going on with the heroes, find out even more moves in terms of the villains as uh, Otto Octavius attacks the assembled heroes. Uh, and we're starting to get set up for the end game here, as I believe we're halfway through this event. Uh, what do you guys think? How are you this feeling? This has been going really great. I like this idea of Luke Cage, and then they ruined it with the last couple of panels. So I don't want to comment too much on it. Um, what, until what I, part? Until I see well, that Foggy was it something, is okay. Uh, we mm. see Foggy show up here and then something. Maybe he gets beaten to death. So I don't think it's a good. They were, they were doing so many great things and then they did something stupid like coming at Foggy. Well, it's not a spoiler when everyone who reads this is happy that it happened. You know? Not everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's weird. Didn't they do one of those phone polls like they did for Jason Todd, but with Foggy? And they were like, kill Foggy or let Foggy live. And there was one vote for let him live. And everybody else didn't even bother to vote because they didn't care. Yeah. Even Foggy called in and was like, let me go. <laughs> Remember when I'm they did that, Robin? Foggy. My clothes barely fit. <laughs> Remember when they did that, Robin Colin? That was before computers and cell phones. Mm-hmm. Wasn't that Poor that was just to make money off of nine hundred numbers, right? It was. That was when Marvel wasn't successful in anything except for <laughs> comics. So they were like, "Let's suck these readers dry." DC, DC, or sorry, DC, DC. Robin is a DC character. You're yes, no, sorry, 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 <laughs> sorry, sorry. DC, DC it was before anything. It was before anything was happening. Oh yeah. my god! At the dawn of time, they said, "Hey, everybody, call uh, in to decide whether Robin lives or dies." Uh, yeah, this comic is great. What were you going to say, Justin? This comic is great. Um, I it, it's rare to get a crossover um, that sort of feels like the old the crossovers we used to read back in the day, like Infinity Gauntlet, where everything exists in the actual title. You don't have to read a bunch of other books, and they touch on a bunch of other characters across the line. And that's what we get here. We get some great like Fantastic Four scenes in this book. We just get great scenes throughout, and uh, it's really nice to read. Yeah. Next up, clear number four from Comixology Originals, written by Scott Snyder, art by Francis Manipool. This issue is pretty much a big battle scene, but as usual, a beautifully drawn one by Francis Manipool. Uh, what do you guys think about this? Yeah, I, I think this is a, a really great issue. I love the action. The art's bananas good. Um, uh, read this a couple of different times just to kind of uh, enjoy the paneling and the art. Uh just absolutely beautiful, fun story. Loved it. Yeah, this is a great. Um, just the writing of this that Scott Snyder does. He, it's like a Scott Snyder's of, a good writer. He's a good writer. There's a ton of stuff that he has to sort of reckon with here. It's like when someone lets their Tetris board get like fucked oh, up. That's stressful. But stressful. But you reading this book, you just feel like. Four lines, four Ooh. lines drop, three lines drop. He's just like coming in and crushing it. And by the end, you're like, you get to the emotional core and you're like, this guy's good at Tetris. Detective Comics number 1050 from DC <laughs> Comics, written by Mariko Tamaki, Mark Wade, Matthew Rosenberg, art by Ivan Rice, Dan Mora, and Fernando Blanco. In this issue, we're continuing the storyline of Arkham Tower. And what exactly has been going on there with a big reveal at the end of that storyline, as well as two backup stories, one that is teeing up Mark Wade's run on New World's Finest ish, uh, series, excuse me, and another backup we've been following for the past couple of issues with Matthew Rosenberg writing about a kid who was caught in an attack between Joker and Batman and is now being manipulated by Scarecrow. This is so good. This whole issue, all three of these stories are so much fun and so uh, exciting to read. The first story uh, focuses very heavily on Huntress in a way that I feel like yes. I haven't read before. Yes. That's very smart. And I'll tell you what, there's a character reveal at the end, the person who is behind Arkham Tower, yeah. who I know is one of your least favorite characters, Justin, but I thought the reveal was great. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. This book... 
So many Arkham stories are about like dissecting, getting into the villain's persona. And this book seems to be about like getting into our hero's persona, especially just this like deep dive into Huntress here is so well done. And you, like we talked about in the past, you see their plan sort of not working of the heroes. Like Nightwing's like, this is supposed to work and it just doesn't. And you just don't see that in comics. This is a very unique story in comics and it's really well done. And the art is fantastic in this book. Um, I just wanted to say you guys, uh, you're welcome. I'm glad that I recommended this comic to put into the stack and I'm glad we're reading it because this has been a really fun journey. Um, but yeah, I think that this is just the Hunter story blew me away. The reveal, uh, cause the buildup of how is this, Arkham Asylum Tower working, like how are people walking around? I thought it was a cool reveal. Might not be your favorite character, Justin. I know how that feels, and I'm sorry. But uh, I really think that this is a, a great package. We're getting a bunch of amazing stories in here. Unbelievable art. Um, yeah, I and this battle for this kid, and like if he's going to be good or bad or be okay, it's been really... Uh, impressive and crazy and uh yeah, yeah surprise back both backups are i mean the a new world's finest is fun like in great little sort of move here with the there was the red kryptonite bit it was in here right mm-hmm. and, and then, it's the arts by dan mora from your favorite once in future pete your guy pete come on and then the, you're talking about the backup with the kid like horrifying end to the oh, issue oh my god yeah Terrifying. And I'm really sorry, Justin, about the character who appears. I hope you're going to be okay. Uh, let's well, move on. really talk- mourning this. I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> Rick Justin, and Morty. It's okay. You can, yeah, you know. you're going to be all right. You're going to be okay. It's I not didn't your even fault. Bring it it's up. not your fault. It's not your fault. Oh my Rick God. and Morty presents Herrick Ticks of Rick, number one from OD Press, written by Amy Chu and Alexander Chang, art by Sarah Stern. This is a Dune parody via Rick and Morty. Now, we've been a little Dune. back and forth. Dune, yep. yes. We've been a little back and forth <laughs> about Rick and Morty books of the past. Which side do you think this one fell on? Well, I don't know about what <laughs> side. It did, you know, a lot of the times uh, these books feel like they're, uh, you know, right in the animation style and humor style. feels like the show in comic book form. This is a little different. Like they made the art feel a little bit different and also uh, the humor a little bit different. It feels very much in the realm, but just, uh, you know, a little heavy on the fart jokes, which they sometimes do, but you know, the, it was a little different. I thought this was cool. It was crazy fun and a nice, you know, kind of homage to Dune. Um, yeah, it was it was all right. It felt a little uh, the dune felt like a bit of a stretch as a thing, right? Anybody? This was not my favorite. I think is what maybe we're bouncing around here. I wanted to like this, and I do think it is a natural fit to throw Rick and Morty on an alien planet out of Dune, but it went into pretty much straight parody without too much more to say. Um, yeah. There are some bits that worked in here. I did like the montage of Morty being the one that happened about two thirds of the way through the book, um, but ultimately. I don't know. I am. That's a, that said, there's a, they're doing a, a Logan's run parody next, which to yeah. me seems much weirder and more specific. So I'm right. Cause it feels that. like a weirder choice. This feels mm-hmm. very like a uh, headline grabby or topical. Exactly. Way. And let me just say real quick. It's not that like, I don't like psycho pirate. Like he's fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just, he's a go-to. He's been a go-to, much like Dune. It's a go-to. He's been a go-to in the DC universe for it's like okay. quite some time. You're going to be okay. You're yeah. going to be okay. I'm just saying, I'm not bothered by it. It's, I'm fine with it. it I'm seems... fine with him being a really, he's a really psychotic pirate. He's a crazy pirate. He even thinks... though he looks, he looks like a tragedy mask from a, a theater yeah, program. But he's quote, known as a psycho pirate. theater, me thinks the lady doth protest too much. Oh boy. I'm the lady. <laughs> Black Panther number three from Marvel, written by John Liddy, really uh, Ridley, Judy Ba, Alex art by Juan Cabral and Abraham Mustafa, Judy Ba, and Jermaine Peralta. In this issue, Black Panther continues to fight against some uh, 
basically somebody is going after the uh, deep cover spies that he has placed in various locations. Here he's tangling with the X-Men, reconnecting with Storm. Pete, as a fan of relationships in the Marvel Universe, what did you think about T'Challa and Storm getting back together? Yeah, it was. it's nice. It's great to see. Um, you know, it's... It's it's still hard to uh, not think of Bozeman whenever I see the just the title Black Panther. But this comic is really phenomenal, really great art. I love the stel- storytelling. Feels uh, very much like a, a great uh, Black Panther comic. I also love the backup story where we get kind of like a cartoon version. Law thought was really creative and cool. Uh, made me think of the old like Superman Mixoplex stories back in the day. Uh, I had a great time with that. I thought it was a uh, it's a solid book, unbelievable art. Um, yeah, I like this too. Seeing um, Black Panther and Storm back together, like their relationship is very well done, sort of across the board. It's a rare relationship in comics where they both get to be themselves, occupy their their own space, and also have sort of a nice connection. Like, they're very powerful people that don't give up any of their power in the relationship, which is cool. Um, I will say it, the headlines about the actress who plays Shuri in, the, in Black Panther and her, like, being anti-vax and all of that, the rumors and all that, has affected how I look at the character. And I feel like that's oh, a really? rare case of the real world, world intruding on my mm-hmm. ability to enjoy a, a character in a comic. It rarely goes that way. Um, but um, but it, it, it pops. It's top of mind for me when I'm reading this. I agree. I'm kind of there, too. And it is very unfortunate. But why don't we move on then and talk about The Human Target, number four from DC Comics, written by Tom King, art by Greg Smallwood. In this issue, The Human Target is continuing to investigate the mystery of who killed him in several days' time, along with Ice, who is tagging along. In this issue, they're tagging along with Blue Beetle, who is solving a bunch of cases and fighting a bunch of bad guys. Um, Another superb issue of... I I keep hesitating to say this because I know you guys are going to make fun of me, but maybe the sexiest book on the stats? Hell yes. This book is like... It's like B. I said this on the live show. This it's like being in love. Reading this book, it's like that when you meet someone who you're attracted to. The flirt, the way that the the sort of early romance that is happening here between um, the human target and Ice is written and drawn. Is it's just it. It's so beautifully done. The art is so great. The writing is so great. It, you get caught up on it, caught up in it, and it's it's great. And the fact that you have Blue, uh, Blue Beetle just sort of droning on throughout the romance, like it feels so real. I feel like I've been in a situation where uh, it, a long time ago where I'm like, oh, I am attracted to that person, and this guy keeps talking about <laughs> nonsense. Uh, and it's just... And on top of that, like, there's a great mystery here. Uh, human Target's slowly dying. Um, it's just there's – this is another great Tom King book. Pete? Yeah, I, I think it's a, a – you know, I – Sorry, I, could you just get out – how horny are you for this book? Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm not as in love with it as Justin is, uh, but I think it's what a great – What about Alex? Spy yeah, thriller. I'm, I'm pretty horny for it, but I, I just want to know. Uh, that. It's kind of like a James Bond type of uh, spy thriller. Uh, very sexy, but uh, amazing art. Really amazing art. But Pete, let me throw this out. You're the rom com guy mm-hmm. on all of our across all of our podcasts. You love romantic comedies, right? Doesn't that don't you feel the romance happening here? I don't, yeah, I guess. I mean, it's not. When you got kind of like a spy, dude, I, I don't know, man. It's you don't like, trust her. That's the thing, right? I don't trust him. I don't trust her. I, you know, I'm not, I, I don't have, I'm not feeling it that way, but I'm glad you guys are swept up in it. You just got to live in the moment. These characters are living in the moment because they're, you know, it's a heated situation, despite the fact that one of them is ice. And uh, it's just happening right now. Yeah. Okay. Stray Dogs, Dog Days, number two from Image Comics, written by Tony Fleeks, art by Trish Forstner. This is the second of two issues exploring various dogs 
who have been kidnapped by <laughs> a serial <laughs> killer. Exploring uh, various dogs. <laughs> exploring various dogs, period. Uh, who have been kidnapped by the serial killer of the main title. This issue is way more horrifying, I would argue, than the first issue, which had yeah. some moments of brightness. We don't get a lot of those here, but still. No, sure st- don't. Stories are phenomenal. Trish Forster's art is phenomenal. Man, this book is so good, and it's nice even though it's harrowing to read, it's nice to get a little bit more of it. Um, yes, um, I agree with you. I love this book. I will say having this being the second issue where we just get back to back, super dark, sad punches in the gut. It is a little overwhelming. Like I miss the sort of the longer format storytelling where we were unraveling the mystery as opposed to just like, horrifying thing, (laughs) horrifying thing, horrifying thing, which is what we get here because they're short stories. Well, that said, I do think without spoiling anything, the last story is about putting that behind us, you know, us as the readers, but also the characters in the book. There's a way they do it indirectly, but it pretty much is giving this Viking funeral to the whole thing, which I thought was a really smart way to do it. And it also tees up very nicely one of Tony Flake's next project, which seems to be about bunnies with guns, but I'm not 100% sure, but looks cool to me. (laughs) I'll check it out. Yeah. Marauders annual number one for Marvel written by Steve Orlando art by Kreese Lee in this issue. Kitty pride is putting together a new crew to track down Dokken, who has been kidnapped and taken back to Xavier's school by a new villain. Pete, this is some of your least favorite things in comic books. what did you think about this one? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, that's the problem. It's, uh, you know, I don't, Dokken, not my favorite, so okay. But, uh, you know, I did appreciate that bad guy getting in the horns at the end. So, you know, what are you going to do? It kind of won me over by the end. Really great art. Despite the fact that it features some characters you don't love, Pete, I do think this book I thought you might like more. I was more than the Wolverine book because it does feel like it's, some more classic X-Men storytelling where it's like they have a mission, putting together a new team. Uh, It feels fun in that the way that this current Hickman-esque X-Men universe isn't. Well, it's not. (laughs) Uh, I like this. I like (laughs) pirate era Kitty Pride. I think that's very fun. I think Steve Orlando writes it very well. Also, he puts in a lot of fun Political commentary is probably the wrong thing, but cultural commentary at the very least going on throughout the book. Um, So that was enjoyable. I was a little confused where they weren't calling him Dockin for most of the book. That took me a weirdly, stupidly long time to figure out, but that's on me. Well, and I also uh, think Steve Orlando has just a great lexicon of uh, X-Men and all any characters he writes continuity and is able to just like really call it up very quickly and bring it to the story, which is great. Task Force Z, number four from DC Comics, written by Matthew Rosenberg, art by Eddie Barrows and Kieran McCallan. In this issue, Jason Todd has finally figured out who is behind the zombie task force. Turns out it's none other than Two-Face, and he finds this out just in time for Task Force Z to be shut down by Amanda Waller. Obviously, there's a couple of twists beyond that, but this continues to be a very fun gross book with some weird Batman villains and I'm enjoying it quite a bit. What about you guys? I agree. I think this is like uh, intense and over the top in all the right ways. It's fun. Great to see all these different villains like this. I think it's a solid book. I really like the way the sort of twists that we end on here um, and the fact that um, Red Hood, Jason Todd, can't help but be a part of this uh, this team um, is is really well done. You don't ever see him treated as someone who has to do something or like is drawn to something. He's always such a rejector that it's cool to see him here. And um, the the end really makes me want to read more. Ice Cream Man, number 28, from Image oh, Comics, boy. written by W. Maxwell Prince, art by Martin Morazzo. In this issue, we're getting the crossover between entomology and etymology as a guy who's <laughs> obsessed with words. Cipher. Cl- yeah, climbs up a mountain to talk to a wise man about the original word. 
as you probably know if you've ever read this series, things get pretty dark. And we also get some teases for the Uber story that, at least as W. Maxwell Prince told us probably at this point a year or maybe more ago on our live show, he's never actually going to get to or finish in any way, which is a little frustrating. I'm going to just throw it out there. Um, but still, another really good issue of Ice Cream Man. But I think with a year gone past and the way this issue is sort of the end of uh, a series of issues and he's taking a break and coming back, I think, April with mm-hmm. the next issue, it does feel like he is going to get to it. It feels like this is specifically pointing at something. I, we, I guess we won't spoil it, but there is something that it's building toward. Whether or not we get there soon or further along, he has to keep heightening it, I think. Uh, yeah. But as for this story, like... Just great comedy, great horror, great tragedy, all happening at the same time. These books are are great. They're, these issues are great. Every single one. It's like uh, a modern O. Henry. You know? Wow. Uh, I just yeah. I it's a true so, gift gift of the Urni. <laughs> <laughs> it's really impressive what this comic book is doing with each and every issue. It's so creative. It's so different. I never know what I'm going to get, and it always delivers. It's really impressive. And it's not always huge moves. It's sometimes very small things. I I just, uh, I'm very impressed with this book. It continues to be a must read. Uh, Speaking of horror, let's move on to Avengers Forever, number two from Marvel, written by Jason Aaron, art by Aaron Cooter and Carlos Magno. In this issue, Ghost Rider, a.k.a. Jaime Reyes, is being tortured in another multiverse by the Black Skull, a venomized Red Skull, to try to get information about who he is and how he has ended up there. It adds in a lot more information about this multiversal Masters of Evil story that Jason Aaron has been building through both Avengers books, but ultimately it just puts Jaime through the ringer here. It's so hard to read, but so well done and so excellently drawn by Aaron Cooter. This is a great issue. Um, th- I agree with you. This was hard to read. And honestly, for the second issue of a comic to be this much of a torture fest, I was really surprised. Um, especially when, like, I I really like this series. I really like where this is going. I'm very excited for the next issue because it's going to feel like such a break from all the bad shit that happens in this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. But it's doing such a great job of setting this all up and and hopefully delivering uh, unbelievable art, great storytelling. Uh, Jason Aaron is killing this. It's really impressive. Next up, Action Comics 1039 from DC Comics, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson and Sean Aldridge, art by Ricardo Frederici and Adriana Mello. In the front story, we are continuing the War World saga as Superman has been forced to fight gladiatorially by Mongol. Uh, the rest of his teammates are trapped in different respects throughout there, but they're trying to figure out this world. Um, continues to be just a really good riff on that classic gladiator storyline, uh, but with Superman. And I love, like we talked about with the last issue, how Philip Kennedy Johnson is just keeping Superman beautifully even throughout this. It's kind of wonderful and inspiring to read. It is. And like the idea that Superman has to learn to use weapons, like not just hold his arm up to block a sword because it's not working. He's been depowered both by lack of connection to a yellow sun and just the general uh, story that he's, he's dealing with that Um, across the board. It's really good. And it's really just building to some wicked Frank Frazetta style paintings um, throughout, which is (laughs) great. Yeah. I just, I, I really love the, the, you know, war world Superman. It's so cool. This is a crazy big story with amazing art. It's really delivering on something that I didn't know that I wanted. And Pete, uh, you got you got your guys still in the mix. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, let's fingers crossed. Near Midnighter. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Good stuff. Really good stuff. Next up, Deadly Class, number 50 from Image Comics, written by Rick Remender, art by Wes Craig. This is continuing to tie up the entire series of Deadly Class as Marcus and... 
Saya? Saya. 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 I blanked on that for a second. Are deciding how to attack her brother and get her sword back. We get a couple of different iterations of that before we finally get the true, real one. There's some final twists there before the end. Um, But I really like how this is wrapping up. I think they're paying an incredible tribute to the characters here. It's sort of a Rashomon style story where we see them sort of imagining um, the different versions of how they attack, which I thought was cool. Um, beautiful, beautiful art as usual. I mean, this book is just always crushing it at this. And you can tell that both Rick and Wes love this book and are putting so much of themselves into it. And as always, we get some great fight sequences and just devastating action and even more devastating emotional hits by the end of the book. I mean, this book is just badass. It is unbelievable art, unbelievable action, storytelling, all these like relationship stuff that's done so well. It's just, I mean, this is just pinnacle comic book stuff. I mean, it's really unbelievable the way the art meets the story. And I, it, it, we've seen the TV show, the, the comic. It's just so awesome and really just i can't say enough amazing things about the the paneling the art the storytelling if you are like hey i need to go down a rabbit hole i i need something that's got some volume some uh, some stuff i can dig into deadly class is where you should go mm. DC versus Vampires number four from DC Comics, written by James Tyne and the Fourth and Matthew Rosenberg, art by Otto Bergy. Schmidt. In this <laughs> issue, Batman and Green Arrow are going mano a mano because each thinks that the other is a vampire. Uh, twist here, though we do this as readers, neither of them are. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. by the end of the issue, they have come face to face with a bunch of vampires. And this continues to be really dark and really fun to read. I agree completely. Like, I really like this. Uh, and it's funny, like, we don't ever see Batman and a- a Green Arrow really hang out together. And it's great. They are a great team up. Um so I really enjoyed that part of it. And just the overall vampire tension. We get some very fun Constantine stuff here where he's like, hey, I'm just trying to hang out with the vampire. Yeah, you know, can like, I just be- catch up a little bit before you still come in and start Dick. killing? It's great. Yeah. Last but not least. Uh, I and- just want to I yeah. just want to say uh, really fun, cool story, really over the top. Uh, I really thought the ending was was fantastic. You you see something like DC vs. Vampires, you're like, Ugh. it's so well done. Worth checking out. Sorry. Wait, real quick before we go on. It this. Me. Only book from before. What do we think about um, uh, Catwoman and Batman's daughter being named Helena Alfreda Wayne? We think about Alfreda. I miss the Alfreda. That sounds like Alfredo sauce. Well, Alfred, you got to give Alfred a shout out, man. So she was named after. In the middle name? No, no, no. She was named after Alfredo sauce. That's what I just said. (laughs) No, dude. It is Batman's favorite sauce. Yeah. I got a preview of the next issue, and there's this very fun fight that they have where Batman wants to name her Marinara and Catwoman wants to name her Alfredo, and they eventually go. Nobody's going vodka sauce? Come on. Uh, That's Dick Grayson comes in. Uh, Vodka's a horrible middle name. And they're like, get out of here, (laughs) Dick Grayson. Oh. Poor Dick Grayson. Oh, my daughter? Yeah, her middle name's Vodka. <laughs> <laughs> Last Write your but not name on least, your homework, babe. <laughs> as requested in the iTunes comments by Kelso Nell. And oh, if you yeah. would like to request something yourself, please drop it in the iTunes comments on the podcast, as mentioned, and we will aim to get to as many of them as we possibly can. A Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from Boom Studios, written by Ryan Parrott, art by Simone DeMeo, Pete as the expert in both of these worlds, what did you think about this crossover? This killed it. I didn't know how much I needed this in my life. Thank you uh, to uh, the person who recommended this. I, I had so much fun. And every time I was like, oh, man, this is crazy. They kept ramping it up more and more. Ah, uh, what a blast. What a great combination of the worlds. The way they kind of worked together, respected uh, each other, I, I just uh, 
just really enjoyable, unbelievable art. I this was an absolute blast. I agree. This was so well done. I did not. I can't believe we haven't talked about this at all. It was really great. Um, shout out to your guy, Dan Mora, doing covers, first off, um, which was cool. And the way that um, the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles knew about the Power Rangers, yeah. I thought was such a smart choice. Very few crossovers do that. They're always like, who are you? And then they yeah, make some jokes, deal? usually. Yeah, yeah. And in this, it, they know them. And I thought that was so smart. And then they, the art's beautiful throughout, um, and we get to honor so much of both of their universes. The fact that we yes. got to see a shot of the Technodrome, Technodrome Shredder, come on. Shredder looks scary Rocksteady, as shit. Bib- Bebop, yeah, oh my god, Shredder is so badass. Bebop, yeah. I, I gotta be Bebop, honest, dude. the first issue, I was like, okay, I get it. They fight, and then next issue, they're gonna get together. So I, I think for like the first two issues, I was like, Yes, I know how this is going to go. I've read this crossover a million times before. This is how every crossover happens. And then, like you're saying, Pete, as it went, it just kept hitting all the points that it should hit, yeah. but in exactly the right way. Like, it's it's satisfying in a way that is not necessarily surprising. It's not going for uber twists or anything like that. It's when they were like, in the turtle van, I was like, yeah, well, this come is, on! Just to spoil a couple of things about it, if you're reading this crossover, what do you want out of it, right? You right. want the villains to be Rita Repulsa and Shredder. You <laughs> yeah. want them to team up. You want the turtles... And the Power Rangers to have to somehow be each swap, other. Swap, yeah. Swap, and they yeah. do. And you want them to ultimately come together in some sort of turtle megazord at the end. Yeah. And that's, like, exactly <laughs> what happens. And it's just, it's very pleasing on that level of, like, yeah. yes, this, it, it's like going into a restaurant and being like, oh, I've heard the pizza here is really good. And you order it, and you're like... This pizza is very good. There's nothing surprising about it, but it's great and it's fun the entire time. Yeah. I'll have the sauce named after your butler. Is that possible on the pizza? <laughs> yeah. It's like, or it's like going into like a game shop and saying, can I get the baby teeth chess set? And they give it to you and then it's full of baby teeth. Yeah. You're like, thank you. We reviewed so many comics today that I forgot that happened in this <laughs> in this episode. You're like, was that the same podcast? <laughs> was that today? Anyway, this trade is great if you want to pick it up. Very I don't good. know I don't know how yeah. long this will last, but at least on Comixology, it was discounted when I checked it out. It was like eleven yeah. ninety nine for all the issues. Well worth, worth the it. money. Worth it. Well Very worth good. it. Thank you, Kelso Nell, for recommending it. We appreciate it again. If any of you want to recommend something in the iTunes comments. Absolutely anything. Happy to chat about. So if you glad like, we read it. If you'd like to support this podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast on YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about comic books. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Comic Book Live on Twitter, comicbookclublive.com for this podcast, and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the comic book shop. R.I.P. Foggy, we'll never see you again. Oh, come on, man. They sit on crap, they